Thank you, and I appreciate all of our witnesses, but we'll proceed now to the questions and answers with our members. And let me just start out why I'm such a big believer personally, because many years ago, probably eight, ten years ago, I happened to walk into Whole Foods. I'm always looking for the new diet, like a lot of people, and you realize those diets, it's up and down and it's another bust, and everybody's got ten stories. But I picked up a book by Dr. Furman, and it just said, they had an equation in there. It was very simple, and it was simply the top of the equation was nutritional quality of the food. So you've got to figure out what that is. Sometimes that's difficult. But underneath that equation was the calories. So the thought was, what is the most nutritional food with the fewest calories? And that changed my life because you don't have to worry about going up and down like a yo-yo in terms of your weight all the time. You can just stay on the program. Now, my grandkids give me a hard time. I've got one back there, number 10, actually checking this out. But my point is, uh, you know, you realize they're saying, Papa, you can't do that or you can't do this. But my, my whole thing in trying to bring that point to you is that's why I'm such a big fan of, you know, food is medicine, because it clearly made a big difference for me. And Dr. Friss, I thought what we do is start with you. Maybe if you could expand on that a little bit more. As it, I'm thinking about medic, Medicare now. Here, you know that, and you've dealt with it for a lot of years, and I'm in Sarasota region, um, Mantee County, Tampa region, and we have a lot of seniors, and all of them count on Medicare. Uh, but at the same token, I want to figure out, we're just over, we just over this year, first time ever, went over a trillion dollars. How can we apply some of these principles to help educate people to maybe take a little better care of themselves? I had a guy, a doctor that I went to, and he said was another thing on a little different thing. Some things stick with me because it works for me. And he said, you know, they come in, they're from the Midwest or the Northeast, come into our area, and they're, you know, 70, 75 years old. They're on four or five pills, six pills. And he says, how would you like to get off half of those? And he said, Doc, I can't get off there. He said, no, seriously, how would you like to get off half? He said, what are you talking about? He said, I want you to start walking two, mile, two miles a day, five days a week, and when you can do that for 30 days, then you come see me, and I'll take you off half of the garbage you're on. But it's not that it's all garbage, but my point is there's something to be said for that as well. But what's your thoughts? We're spending over a trillion dollars. You know, we've got the debt and the deficit. You, you brought that up. But I'm obviously very concerned about that, but I'm also concerned about, you know, the health care and where, where all this is going and how we start bending the curve on some of the costs, because we're paying more and more, and we're getting less and less. And I think everybody pretty much, to say, especially in the last 10 years. Uh, so what, what's your thought, Dr. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I think that is the, the really overriding question. Given where we are today in 2024, what is different than when I was on that side of the dais and in 2003 we did the Medicare Modernization Act? And what is neat about it is, in just listening to the, the panel, we are in such a better position today in terms of the science itself, of whether it's understanding addiction based all the way from opioid disorder back to sugar today, in terms of the science itself, in terms of what works and what doesn't work. It, in 2003, which was the last big modernization of Medicare, um, we invented Medicare Advantage to manage patients better. And it's had its ups and downs, and I'm sure here people are, some are for it and against it and all. But the whole idea of being able for a group of the population to help manage, let them make their choices, making the healthy choice the easy choice, requires data, it requires information. We have underinvested in this country in NIH funding for prevention and specifically for food. Only 5% of the NIH budget goes to nutrition prevention, yet we are saying uniformly that it is a root cause, a root cause of this burden of disease that we have to deal with today. In 2003, we had value-based care introduced. Our outcomes were readmissions to a hospital, death, these really, that's all the endpoints that we have. Now with the science, we have a number of endpoints to apply. We have social determinants of health. We have the importance of food, of transportation, of access, of prevention itself. That's number one. Number two, we have Medicare Advantage, about half the Medicare population, and then we have the non-Medicare Advantage fee for service. I think the committee can continue to make it more uniform in terms of what is expected in terms of nutrition. 
Social determinants of health, there are four or five that are now recognized in 2024 today. The social determinants themselves that are required in hospitals, that can be expanded to the outpatient arena, not just for Medicare Advantage, but also for the non-medical determinants. And then lastly, I think conceptually, we need to follow the patient in Medicare as we look at Medicare policy and not the plan and not just the traditional outcomes, but follow the patient over time. And that takes data, good science up front, we've underinvested in the past, and then applying that science in an evidence-based way in real time going forward. With that, it becomes a true public health, both crisis, but a public health problem not just addressing the endpoints of admissions, what happens in the hospital, whether or not you die of a heart attack, but actually what you're eating and the impact it's having in the preventive aspects of moving forward.